what exactly does TAC do or what, what are we? We're a government-owned organisation um, and our responsibility, I, I guess it's two key responsibilities. One is, is a major road safety um, uh, function, which you will also our, our ads and our preventative functions that we try and uh, achieve from a road safety point of view. The other thing that we do is, is manage, and this is probably the, the biggest part of what we do, is manage claims for people who are injured in motor vehicle accidents, and that, um, uh, in many cases, that's a lifelong uh, entitlement that those clients will have. It's managed under the Transport Accident Act, so it's legislated. Uh, and uh, as I said, the idea is to try and make sure that we have a compensation scheme that, uh, that is available for these people that are injured um, for as long as they need the care and the, the treatment that they may need as a result of their injuries. Uh, the way the TAC model works, so you're all familiar with the fact that you um, get slugged a, a little bit extra when you pay your registration every year. And so a big component of that's your TAC charge, and uh, that goes towards, um, I guess, funding the TAC scheme. So TAC gives some of that money to, to fund road safety initiatives, such as our ads and our promotions that we do with school-aged children in terms of driving and the learner programs that we have. Uh, a remainder of that, uh, of that money we use is funded towards uh, trauma services and for healthcare and disability support for people on an ongoing basis. Just to give you an idea of the sorts of numbers that we get, we get uh, a bit over 19,000 claims per year uh, and we have about 43,000 active claims at any one time. We have a lot of clients that come on and off those benefits but we do have some clients uh, particularly severe brain injury and uh, spinal injured clients who stay on our books pretty well um, for good. They, they need treatment and care for the rest of their life. Um, this just gives you a bit of a breakdown from a injury perspective in terms of the sorts of injuries that we see. So over 50% of the injuries are soft tissue, musculoskeletal injuries, and then we have orthopaedics, uh, fewer what we call other severe injuries, so they might be internal, severe internal injuries. And then the a uh, small proportion of fatal accidents, thankfully, although all too too many, and we have about 6% of catastrophic injuries, so they're there, those head injuries and uh, spinal and amputee injuries that I was talking about uh, a little earlier. In terms of the money that we spend, uh, last financial year we spent over $930 million, uh, in total payments to clients, and that's, so that's a real mixture with you know, nearly $100 million in lifetime care payments. Uh, we spent a bit over 90 million on loss of earnings payments, so that's income benefits. I'll talk a little bit about that a bit later. Um, and uh, over 200 million on um, hospital and paramedical and ambulance payments. We also spend quite a lot of money every year on uh, what are called common law payments, lump sum payments to clients for pain and suffering and damages payments, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about as well. Just a, a little bit more information from a road safety point of view. Um, you, that graph just gives you a bit of a snapshot of the demographics of the clients. And that's just the first two months of this year, but it's pretty typical of the types of um, demographics that we see. So um, while I'll talk a little bit more about older drivers today, pretty much mo uh, the, we, we have a predominantly young male driver um, uh, demographic, which I'm sure isn't a surprise to anyone. Um, and we do a lot of uh, work in that area, but you'll see um, we've got a breakdown in terms of um, whether people are cyclists or drivers or motorcyclists and a bit of a split there from a um, rural and urban perspective, um, which is pretty typical of what we see. Um, so we have this big bunch that are 18 to, say, 39-year-olds, uh, males. It's about 70% of the claims that we manage. Uh, in terms of older road users, now, no... Uh, Fitness to drive is, is not just older users, the older road users, certainly lots of young people that have disabilities that is a concern for as well, but as we're all aware, a lot of our older road users fall into that bracket. So just some stats in terms of um, older, older users on the road. Um, so some information there in terms of the road toll. So about 15% of uh, the road toll is uh, people above the age of 70. Uh, there's some information there in terms of the um, acute hospitalised claims. And just a little bit of information in terms of older road users and uh, I guess the types of accidents they may be involved in. And one of particular interest I think is um, older road drivers in, from a fatality point of view t tend to be more mid-block accidents rather than intersection accidents. What that means when you drill down into that a little bit more is a lot of them, almost 50% of them happen out on um, on rural roads or on highways, 100k plus, fatigue's a major issue, 
Um, so that, that's certainly some of the areas that we try and focus on in the um, road safety po point of view. Uh, general demographics in our society shows that that's not going to, that, that older road use, um, not a problem, but those issues that are faced aren't going to go away. Um, at the moment, Victoria has a sustained low fertility rate, increasing life expectancy. Our uh, percentage of, older, uh, of the older population is just going to continue. Uh, so it's about 6.5% of the population in Victoria at the moment. It's expected it'll be over 7% in another five years. And that graph, I'm not sure how well you can see that, but basically what that says is by the year 2056, it's going to be almost 14% of our uh, population will be over over the age of 75. So um, how correct that will be into the future, some of us might be around to find out, but um, <laughs> uh, th that's what the, I guess that's what the um, Population Demographics um, Bureau of Statistics people tell us at the moment. Uh, Trisha's already covered off responsibility of Vic Road, so I won't go any further there. I know Morris and, and Trisha have already spoken a bit about obligations here, but of course, there's no statutory obligation for medical practitioners or health practitioners to um, report medical conditions in Victoria. South Australia and Northern Territory have that. We don't. There is an option to report. Obviously, it raises all sorts of um, conflict issues from a confidentiality and privacy point of view for practitioners. There's also public safety considerations that need to be considered, but I'm, I'm not telling anyone here anything that they don't know already. Um, from a driver's point of view, they have a, a duty to report and that's already been covered off. Um, there's some legislation there that talks about that. Um, and as Tricia mentioned, there's um, failure to report for the driver can have consequences from a property insurance perspective, uh, can potentially lead to uh, criminal charges. Uh, Janine might talk a bit more about that, such as culpable driving. But what about if there is an accident and TAC benefits? Is that affected if they have um, known that they are medically unfit to drive and have continued to do so? Well, the answer is yes and no. Um, uh, mostly no. Uh, TAC is a, there's two sides of the TAC scheme. There's what we call no-fault benefits, which includes medical and rehab expenses, uh, income support, uh, impairment benefits. And then there's a common law um, aspect, which is general damages and pecuniary loss. I'll talk a little bit more about all of those. Um, the difference there is the no-fault aspect. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you cause the accident, whether it's a single vehicle accident, um, you're entitled to your medical and rehab expenses under the no-fault side of the scheme. So even if you were a driver in that situation, uh, you still have uh, TAC cover for all those benefits. Uh, you would be considered to be a negligent driver if you did that and you wouldn't have any access to common law. The way common law works is you effectively need to have someone else to sue. TAC then indemnifies that person, which is usually another driver. It gets a little bit complicated, but I'll try and simplify it. Um, this graph I won't stay on for too long, but this just gives you a bit of an idea in terms of uh, the no-fault benefits that TAC can pay and how long they're payable for. So, so there's some limitations around the income benefits that we can pay. Uh, it's usually only up to three years unless someone is seriously injured, and in that case they can, uh, they can get it to retirement age, and uh, there's all sorts of tests around um, what that serious injury is. It's an impairment rating test. Uh, but other benefits such as medical services and hospital services are uh, basically if a person needs it then and, it's, and the benefits are related to their accident then they're entitled to it for the remainder of their life. Some of our clients certainly will, will need that. So just a little bit more information on what no-fault benefits are. So there's a whole range of them. It's a very generous scheme. Um, so you'll see from, right through from ambulance to hospital to medical services. Uh, we fund paramedical, home and vehicle modifications for clients that need it. Um, disability services such as attendant care and accommodation support for clients who usually have severe brain injury and can't return to their previous lifestyle. Uh, income replacement I spoke about. Um, there are some restrictions around income replacement if you were, uh, let's say, an unlicensed driver or a, or a drunk driver, then, then there's some limitations on that. You probably won't get it. You will get your medical services. Um, and dependency and family counselling payments, they're there for fatal um, accidents. So uh, for um, any people that die, if they have um, financial dependents, uh, such as a, a wife or children, then there's some um, financial payments that are, that are made to them. Uh, we cover funeral benefits and we'll also pay family counselling to, to the families as well to a certain, to a, uh, a certain uh, dollar amount. 
I thought I'd just put a little bit of information in terms of what we can fund from a driving program point of view. For We have many clients who um, were obviously driving at the time they have the accident and, and are keen to return to that. And for some reason or other, they, that may take them longer than, than, um, than, than some others. So we do have driving programs where we can fund a lot of, under the no-fault benefits, um, we can fund a lot of different programs from specialist driving instruction, obviously OT services to do initial assessments and then so also to help plan what a return to, dri return to driving program may look like. Uh, driving lessons we will, we will fund um, for people that need those lessons to get back if they had a, had a licence beforehand. Uh, we won't fund driving lessons for someone that didn't have a licence beforehand unless they need more than about 20, which is what we think is, is what... Uh, someone on a learner program would need anyway. And then some more information there, I won't go through all of that, Trish has covered a lot of that off in terms of what we would consider as needed in terms of medical clearance before we would look at funding those return to driving programs. Uh, and then just a little, uh, a few extra things there in terms of what else we might be able to fund. So I've mentioned OT services, uh, we can fund psychology services for clients who, some of our clients are, are fearful of returning to driving um, particularly if they've had a very traumatic accident, so we can fund some psychology services around that, and we obviously will be able to fund some vehicle modifications for those clients who've got physical injuries and um, need their vehicles modified to be able to help them return to driving. And then there's a list of things there where, of things that we won't pay for um, in, rel in relation to um, driving programs. All of that information, we have a very detailed policy which is on our website, but uh, very, very quickly, what are impairment benefits? So you may have noticed on one of the slides earlier, um, there was an impairment benefit that's included under no fault um, entitlements that a client can get. So it's a, it's a lump sum payment that is made to clients um, depending on the level of um, injury that they sustain. Again, there's a very complex way of evaluating that, um, but a client can receive up to $300,000 as a lump sum payment as a no fault benefit. Um, we don't see very many people that are 100% compared, but you may see a typical example might be a ventilated quadriplegic would fall into that sort of category, so there's not many that, that are at that level, thankfully. Uh, now, common law, so the other side of the scheme, this is where they're, they're, you, don't, you can't access common law unless you have someone to sue, basically. Um, so if you're a negligent driver and cause the accident, then you will receive all of those no-fault benefits that I've just spoken about but you have no access at all to common law. If you're a passenger in a car, you're a pedestrian, you're a driver of another vehicle that didn't cause the accident, then you can also access common law benefits. Um, and basically what T TAC will indemnify the negligent party, which is you, the other driver. So we're kind of involved on both sides of the claim. Um, and uh, from a common law point of view, there's, there's a bit of legislation around um, you need to be at a certain level of, the injury needs to be a certain level of um, seriousness before it, it's called a gateway, before you can actually get into common law benefits. Um, that's designed to protect the scheme really to, to prevent a lot of very small, what we would consider frivolous claims getting into this um, category and, and really being an administrative burden on the TAC. The old Motor Accident Board back in the 80s experienced that problem and pretty well went bust on the back of it. So there's some legislation that helps to protect the scheme from that point of view. But they're the, they're the sorts of injuries that you would, um, uh, the legislation considers to be serious. Um, permanent serious disfigurement would be pretty well, serious scarring really falls into that category. Um, loss of a fetus gets in straight away. The other two areas, serious long-term impairment of a body function or severe long-term mental impairment, there's lots of litigation that goes around what, whether people achieve those categories or not. Um, many people get straight through and there's not, a, there, there's not any dispute about that, but um, in other cases there is. Uh, and just to give you a bit of an idea in terms of what is available from a, um, uh, a common law perspective, the statutory maximum for common law is a bit over a million dollars, um, and that would be made up of someone that would be, someone that would achieve that sort of figure would be someone that's very young, maybe in their early 20s, they're not going to return to work for the rest of their life, so they're looking at probably about 40 years of pecuniary loss, um, plus there's an um, a amount that's calculated based on general damages, pain and suffering, uh, those sorts of things, depending on the, the level of their injury. 
So just in summary, TSE, uh, it's, it's very socially inclusive legislation and what I mean by that is the no fault side of the scheme doesn't look at fault. So um, even if you're a uh, even if you're convicted of culpable driving and you, this is an extreme case, but you cause an accident, you're, drunk, you're a drunk driver, you, you kill someone else in the accident, even if you do jail time, you won't get services while you're in jail, but when you come out, you're still entitled to those benefits, the no-fault benefits. Clearly, you wouldn't get in the common law. Um, and, uh, but I guess coming back to the return, to the, the fitness to drive, I guess that, that's where the... the um, the, the common law side of the claim um, will come into play and certainly if someone is driving um, and they shouldn't be or they don't have medical clearance to do so then it very very clearly will affect that side of any claim that they would have with TAC. And then just a couple of, a couple of points plugging our road safety message. Uh, so that's, a, that's about it for me. Thank you.